Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm really excited about the next panel we'll be bringing you, where we're going to learn how to leverage evidence to shape government programs at scale. All of the panelists here are coming from the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, a group that uses cost-effectiveness analyses and control trials to figure out the effectiveness of anti-poverty programs. Here we have uh, Rachel Glenister, a proud Giving What We Can member and founder of the Give Well recommended charity, Deworm the World, as well as having a day job as the executive director at JPAL. We also have a couple of their international staff, uh, Gautam Patel, joining us from uh, the South Asia division, as well as Vivian Bronsler, uh, who's joining us from the Latin America and Caribbean. And finally, we have uh, John, sorry, I'm forgetting your last name, uh, John Floretta, apologies, um, who is their associate director of policy and will be moderating them. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure that each of you can ask them questions when they get to the panel section. So please put this link into your phone, and I'll get some thumbs up from the audience when you've done so, so we can move into the talks. Cool. And share the links with your friends next to you if you haven't gotten it already. Rachel, mind kicking us off? Great. So I want to talk to you today about the incredible leverage that I think um, effective altruists can have by working with governments in developing countries and making the, helping them use their money more effectively. Um, uh, I, uh, as the introduction said, I work at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, which is a network of researchers, over 120 researchers around the world, who do randomized trials and cost effectiveness analysis to evaluate what is the most effective way of reducing poverty and addressing the needs of the poor. So as effective altruists, we are concerned with extreme poverty. And while we heard from Peter Singer yesterday that the numbers in extreme poverty are declining, um, there are still hundreds of millions of people living on less than $190 a day. And what's interesting is that over half of those are now in middle-income countries. And that gives us a particular um, opportunity because many of those middle-income countries are spending huge amounts of money on anti-poverty programs. This is just expenditure for health, um, but the same is, is true in other areas of social spending. And if we zoom in on um, spending in the areas that have some of the highest levels of extreme poverty, we see that's even true here. So in South Asia um, and in India, uh, there are very large sums of money being spent by the, the domestic governments on health. There's also a lot of spending by the poor themselves on health and education. And very little of the spending is coming from external sources, including external aid, whether governmental or individual. So one of the problems with this, however, is that a lot of government aid, uh, government spending by domestic uh, governments is spent on inefficient inputs. So in education, we've seen that uh, a lot of, of spending goes on inputs, which randomized trials have shown, have no impact on learning levels in the school. So if you add textbooks, if you add more teachers, if you add more uh, computers to the classroom, and even if you give uh, schools cash to spend on whatever they want, you see no increases in learning in schools. Also in the area of health, you see a lot of spending on very expensive cure uh, programs, whereas we know that the most cost-effective programs tend to be health prevention programs. And both governments and, the, and private the, uh, sectors, the poor themselves, spend much more on the cure side than on the prevention side. Another area where we have government inefficiency is due to leakage or corruption. So as an example, the Indonesian government has a massive program to provide subsidized rice to the poor in Indonesia. So 17.5 so million households get this subsidized rice, or meant to, at a cost of $1.5 billion in 2012. But in 2012, only a third of the intended beneficiaries received that intended subsidy. 
quite a lot of people got no rice, and others had to pay more than they were meant to for the subsidized rice. But working with the Indonesian government, we tested ways to improve the efficiency of that program and get more rice to the people who needed it. So simply providing an ID card to those who were meant to get the subsidized rice with their name on it, how much rice they were meant to get and what price they were meant to pay, meant uh, increased the amount of subsidy going to poor families by 25%. So 25% increase in the effectiveness of a program that's over a billion dollars a year is an awful lot of impact. For, for our, you know, the, the investment we made was simply a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to do a big scale randomized trial and prove that, to the government that this was effective. And the government has scaled this up to 66 million people. Another area where governments can, another reason governments can be inefficient is because of lack of accountability. So in the Indonesian case, the Indonesian government really wanted to improve the effectiveness of that program, but sometimes politicians don't have the right incentives. So one thing that we observe a lot in the developing world is that voting based on caste or based, based on ethnicity we also see that, I should point out, in the US, very strong relationships between, between ethnicity and voting patterns. So this is an example of Sierra Leone, where you see a very strong correlation between uh, the ethnic uh, composition of the population and how they vote. Which means that if you are an APC candidate running in the north of Sierra Leone, you are almost inevitably going to get elected, which really reduces accountability of the politicians and that can lead to inefficient, corrupt government. Now that looks like a very intractable problem and as effective altruists we want to work on, a, on tractable problems. And yet there's increasing evidence that you can change the way people vote. This was an experiment I did in Sierra Leone. We worked with a local NGO who, uh, who ran debates between MP candidates and they, these debates were videoed and then screened in a random selection of communities across the country. That increased voter knowledge in the, polling, in the areas around the polling stations where these were screened. Voters had much more information about, about their candidates and they changed how they voted, even in Sierra Leone where there's very strong ethnic voting. The MPs who were part of the experiment, the MPs who participated in debates, were also more accountable. They had more meetings with their constituents, and they were given money by the, by the central government to spend in their constituency, and we could trace more of that money on the ground in their constituencies. Another example of improving the effectiveness of democracy leading to increased benefits for the poor is in Brazil, where they introduced electronic voting, which was designed to help illiterate people vote uh, and exercise their vote. And it was very effective. It reduced the spoiled ballots, in, particularly in areas with low literacy levels uh, by 10 percentage points. So people who found it difficult to vote on paper because they were illiterate could handle the electronic voting machines. And because this was rolled out over time, it could be rigorously evaluated, and we find that there was increased spending in health in the areas that benefited most from this, and actual physical health of the population increased because of this um, increased accountability uh, and improved democracy. Now, this suggests an important role for philanthropists in improving the effectiveness of government spending. So this is a highly leveraged opportunity because of the billions of dollars that governments are spending to reduce poverty and not always very effectively. So we can do this in three ways. We can provide actors within government who really care about improving the effectiveness of their programs with evidence about what's the right way to improve their programs. We can help build institutions within governments to make governments to build evidence into the policy-making process, and my colleagues are going to talk a bit about how to do that. Um, and we can help citizens of these countries hold their own governments to account 
by helping them, by providing information um, and getting them uh, more able to participate in the, uh, in, the, in the process. And that can lead to more effective, more efficient uh, government and more help for the poor. So I'm going to hand over to, to my colleagues who actually are doing this work with governments uh, in the countries where they work and, and doing the hard work of convincing governments to introduce evidence uh, into their programs. So first, Gautam, who works in the South Asia office um, of PayPal. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Gautam Patel. I'm working on the, in the policy team in JPAL South Asia. We're a team of 20. And I've been working for JPAL South Asia for the last three years. Before then, I worked on the opposite side of policy outreach. Um, so I worked for state governments in India. I reported to the, the state elected head. And my desk was next to the, this, one of the senior most bureaucrats in terms of a policy decision maker. Um, what i excited to talk to you about today is how we're supporting governments to scale up, as Rich was talking about, scale up effective anti-poverty programs to address extreme poverty. And I think what, what you're all most interested in is uh, a particular gap. And what that gap is that we do have evidence of which programs are effective. Um, and we know the details of that. On the other side, we have governments who are the decision makers who have substantial funds. They have resources, they have staff, they have buildings across um, their states, across the country. But the gap is between the two. Uh, the gap is how do we get those decision makers to absorb that evidence and change systems and processes, systems that have been going on for, for many, many decades. How do you switch um, over to that? So that's what I'm going to be unpacking and telling you about today. I'm going to illustrate that with a particular program. This is a supplementary education um, remedial program. It's been developed by Pratham Education Foundation. It's a very large NGO in India. Uh, JPAL researchers have evaluated this program multiple times, uh, six times in India in different locations. Um, always seeing a, you know, a very um, strong impact. It's a very effective program in raising children's learning levels. And it's generalizable to other contexts. Um, so let, let me, let's step into the problem. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the, the, the problem is you know, India is a country with one million schools. In, the, in elementary education, we have some like 200 million children. Um, the good news is classrooms have been built, teachers are employed, and most children are enrolled, which is a different picture compared to a couple of decades ago. The shocking pro pro problem is that the children, despite being in school for five years, this is from, from surveys, half of them cannot read. Um, by what I mean by cannot read, it's a, a simple, this is a survey with a, a simple sentence, a simple paragraph. It's a class two text that we're asking them to read. And we're finding half of them can't read. Now, when I first saw this data, I couldn't quite get my head around it. You know, you've, got, you've got classrooms, there are teachers, the teachers obviously they can read. So why is it that the children still, half of them, as many as half, um, can't read? So a very critical problem in extreme poverty, because these are children who obviously won't progress. They won't stay. They will drop out um, later on in school. They won't go, go further in their education. They won't have the basic tools of learning. Um, similar with mathematics as well, you know, dramatically high figures of children not being able to do the, these basic sums. And I'll tell you a little bit later about why that is. Um, so looking at the, the long-term data for this, so very unfortunately, what we're seeing, this is from 2007 to 2012, the same survey data, the same tests for the children. Um, it, it's falling, you know, the, those learning outcomes, you know, can they read, can they do basic maths operations? It's falling year on year. But the tremendous opportunity, and this is what um, Rachel was also touching on, is that you know, the, the governments have funds, they have very sizable funds for this. Year on year, the elementary education budget has increased um, in India. The figure there for 2012-13 is 27 billion US dollars. That's also the absolute figures have increased. Also, the per child funding has also increased, which is good news. That largely is on some of its buildings. It's fixed to staffing. But sections of that are for teacher training, uh, innovation, monitoring. And these are all components that we're having conversations with, with heads of schools in, in states, about how to use that more effectively. And that's what I'm going to talk, talk to you about. So here, what I'm, what I'm setting up is a tremendous opportunity we have uh, for more effective programs and scaling that up where government has um, the resources and the people in place. So let me unpack a bit more about you know, the, the problem, this, learn, this crisis in learning gains, which is not just in India, you know, surveys in other countries, um, Mexico, Senegal, Sierra, Sierra Leone, is, is showing the same thing. The children are enrolled in the schools. The schools are there now, but they're not learning um, despite year on year. 
So this photo here is a, a, a typical classroom. This is a, a rural classroom in Gujarat that I visited. And what we're seeing is one size fits all. The teacher, all the, the children are there, the teachers there. You can even see computers. We have a lot of computers in the Gujarat schools as well. One textbook, chalk and talk, one size fits all. In the sense that despite, irrespective of those children's learning levels at the start, they're all getting the same type of teaching. Whether they can read or whether they can read, but maybe they can't comprehend. It's expected that the teacher's gonna move through the syllabus. Um, so chalk and talk, not many resources. Teaching the, to the top. So five children in that class will be putting their hands up. They'll be saying, yes, I know the answer, and the teacher will move on through. So this, this is what we're seeing from the JPAL researchers' findings and, and broader um, research in India and, and other countries, that this global phenomenon of classroom instruction is not changing decade on decade. So coming to what we're interested in is a particular program which has evidence of being effective. So this is, it's interactive teaching that's targeted at the child's learning level. So the problem is we, we, the classroom's in front of the teacher. The children are all varied levels. Some children might have been ill the year before, they might have missed school. Some are readers, some aren't. It's, it's a mix, but we're, we're doing the same thing. So instead of that, it's a very simple model. It involves uh, four to six days of training of teachers, an activities kit which is roughly 30 US dollars per school. It's, it's, it's very cheap. A rapid assessment where a quick check can that child recognize letters? Can they read words? Can they put the words together to make sentences? Once we've done that um, quick check, the teacher can regroup, reorganize classes three, four, and five, mm -hmm. such that they're in their learning level groups. And across the year, we have monitoring and mentoring to make sure that this shift in pedagogy continues. So what, what does the classroom look like now? So you know, I've shown you the one-size-fits-all classroom, that, you know, the problematic um, classroom. This is what and this is a, a similar school again in Gujarat after when the intervention's happening. So here the children are in three different groups, not according to their age or their standard, but this is their learning level. So some children who cannot yet pick up letters, they have the materials that help them gain that. Some of the children who want to move from word to sentences, they're in that group. The teacher is now sitting with the children. It's interactive. As you can see, those materials, you know, they're paper-based. There's games that happen with chalk on the floor. It's very, very low cost. So now coming to the evidence of impact. So as I mentioned, there's been multiple RCTs, randomized control trials of this particular program. And I tell you about one of these in a state, Uttar Pradesh, in the, in the north of India. It's India's most populous state, 200 million people. Um, so here at the start, so this is 2014, it's one of the more recent of the RCTs. In 2013, at the start of the school year, when we did this quick rapid assessment of children's learning levels, children in class three, four, and five, only 15% um, could read, and this is the this, this simple paragraph. Much lower than the India, India average. This was two districts of Uttar Pradesh, 500 schools. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna show you what, what happened across the school year with a normal way of teaching, so as in with, without the program. So across that first school year, we do see improvement. 24% um, of children can read at the end of the school year. So now, this particular variant of, this, uh, of the program was a 50-day intervention of two hours a day. As, as I mentioned, it's a supplementary um, remedial edu education program. Pratham staff and volunteers were using the methodology I just, I just showed you on the slides. So in the subset uh, of the 500 schools of the RCT, in the subset where we use this 50-day program, this methodology, we see 48% of children being able to read a simple paragraph at the end of the school year, after the, the 50 days that I mentioned, which are in bursts um, across the time. So what we're seeing is more than double, more than double the learning gains for this very critical problem, the critical problem I talked about, which is half the children cannot read. Um, so in this case, it, it, it was much lower. As well as this particular RCT, we've also studied this effectiveness of this program through government teachers um, in schools. Again, it's, so for one hour or two hours of their day, they use this, uh, the innovative pedagogy. Again, we're seeing substantial gains. So that's great. So now what, what we have is number of studies, evidence, this program, this program is effective um, for a very extreme situation. And I said that the, the, what I want to spend more time with you talking about is the, the problem, the gap with how do we convince the head of schools, the, the, the policy maker, to commit funds, resources, instruct teachers, instruct their staff to adopt this effective program. Um, so in this, there's three things. So, uh, the policy team in JPAL South Asia, there, there are 20 of us. 
About more than half were based in Delhi, and a number of them are based in the states, working very closely um, both with our implementation partners like Pratham and the government at state level and lower down. So the three things we're doing, one is convince the decision makers with evidence. Two, building motivation and capacity to drive the program. So, you know, yes, the, uh, the head is saying, the boss is saying go ahead, but the, the team lower down. Um, and as well as this, better monitoring and data to make sure this compliance according to that evidence-based model, the different components are happening as we've seen to ensure impact happens on a large scale. So first of all, convincing policymakers. Um, so the typical policymaker in India, the bureaucrat, is in his job for about one and a half or two years before he's transferred to a different department. Very busy, you know, not much time, lots of other things happening. How do we make space for this conversation where we've got evidence, evidence for a program that works? What we've tried you know, much earlier, if you look back you know, sort of five years in the policy team, we've had briefings, that we're showing the data, something similar to what I'm showing you today. We had you know, a large conference um, through USAID. But we did not find this effective in uh, policymaking changing their decisions as well. What we have found in the, the photograph here shows you know, a closed door meeting where uh, Pratham is there, uh, Jaypal is there, the, policy, the policymaker is there, showing the evidence. The, the policymaking can ask critical questions about that evidence and, and localizing it according to the constraints in their state and the follow, a, a number of follow up meetings in the sense of how do we design that. Uh, people who are you know, familiar with developing countries, you know, there's, there's a lot of churn. It's very, very dynamic. The, the politicians are changing, the bureaucrats are changing, a, a lot of issues. So our team is also just to give you a snapshot of how we're working. We're tracking those changes to understand that, to ensure long-term commitment for this particular program. So the good news is, and things that I think we were initially surprised by, um, uh, MOUs are signed. So the governments are literally signing, saying, yes, we will commit our funds, our resource, for this evidence-based scale-up as you laid out. So that's great. That, you know, the first MOU was signed in 2013, and there's a number with other states after that. After we have that signature on paper, you know, according to the evidence, then what? And then this is a big question. And uh, the, the numbers when I talked about, it, again, very difficult to um, understand, like huge numbers. This is... 200 million children across the country, and at any one state, are hundreds and thousands of children. Um, so how do we reach them with this model? So underneath that boss is, as I mentioned, it's a local administration. So number one is building their commitment. So these are people for decades, a, a good couple of, you know, two or three decades of their career. They have been doing the chalk and talk. They have been doing one sites as all. That's how they grew up. How do we change their mindset? We send the supervisor of schools, the Bratham sends them to, to a classroom to use the model as a, the evidence-based model, test the children before and after a, a quick 15, 20 days. They get convinced, they see it works. They see, yes, these are children who were struggling before, they were not learning, they're engaged. You know, the learning levels are going up. These be become the champions and drivers of this program. We're also ensuring that they regularly review the program, track the schools, track the children, because they're the ones who are going to ensure the teachers stick with this pedagogy change as well. And, and by scale, what I mean, so that one state, Gujarat, for example, has 4,000 of these school supervisors across 30,000 schools. So how can we enable, how can we motivate and build their capacity um, to ensure that they drive the program? Um, uh, Monitoring systems and data. So uh, Indian schools have lots of data. You know how many fans are there, the, the classroom size, and the children's learning levels. There are annual assessments of this. The government's own data. Issues. It comes six months to a year after it's collected. So by that time, people will have changed jobs. There's issues in accountability. It's not live, and we're certainly not for mid-course correction. The great thing about this program is we're checking, the, assessing the children's learning levels as part of the program at the start, and then three more times through the school year. So initially, this is on paper. What we trialed last year is mobile phone um, data entry, so we can have instant analysis. So now the exciting thing is that the, the teacher, the school supervisor, knows instantly which of the schools where things are going well, the children's learning outcomes are progressing, and the processes is the key thing. So that we, we know the evidence-based components of this model. We know there should be a kit that arrives on time. Teachers should be trained. The children have to be regrouped accordingly, otherwise it's not going to work. We can track those, and we can have alarm bells where something's not happening out of those components in a particular locality, and address that. Because we have people, the, the government has the people on the ground um, to give that targeted support. So again, we found this, it, it, what I'm talking about here is after the, the sign-off, after the conviction, having the right systems and processes in place, and our team getting on the ground, in the field, understanding how these people can relate with these mechanisms, what data they need, and ensuring that they uh, scale up the evidence-based program. 
Um, so I'm wrapping up now. So we have signed commitments from four state um, governments um, for scaling up this program. As you can see, that, that, that amounts to over a million children. So typically what happens in the first year, a state will um, agree to piloting the program in something like you know, 300 schools, it might be 1,000 schools. They want to tweak it, adjust the model for their localization, and then scale up phase by phase to cover the state. So different states are at different um, phases of, the, of that scale up year on year. Our policy teams are dedicated for this program. The JPAL South Asia team, where there's seven of us full time in the state, so in Delhi, um, our travel, our time, the design tools we're processing is, is roughly um, 100,000 US dollars a year for, for that support. To leverage you know, a huge amount of government resources, both funds and people, to scale up an effective program. And the Pratham teams are you know, management and trainers of something like you know, 50 people per state to support the government with the handholding of, of that knowledge. Uh, the JPAL team is funded by two family trusts in Europe and one family trust in the Bay Area, it's the, the Skoll Foundation. And going ahead, what I'd say what our major challenge is that so we, we feel that you know, we, we, we definitely, as you can see, we can get this, the sign-offs, the commitments from the government because they also see this as a top priority. You know, how do we solve this learning crisis of children who, who aren't reading with an effective program? What our major challenge is now is ensuring we can set up the system and process that government functionaries themselves can lead on a, on a super large scale as well. So thank you. So now, and now I'll just pass on to my colleague Vivian as well. Thank you, Gautam. So, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vivian Bronsoler. Uh, I joined APAL a little bit over two years ago, right after finishing my graduate degree here at the Policy School at Berkeley, so it's been great to be back. Uh, I'm the manager for Mexico and Central America, but I'm also leading the efforts about institutionalization, the use of evidence in the process decision making that we're deploying across the region. And I'm going to, the, during the following minutes, I will be walking you through what we mean about institutionalization, the use of evidence and innovation. And also, I'm going to give you an example of a specific laboratory we have established within the Ministry of Education in Peru. So the context in Latin America, as you may all know, is slightly different from the context that Rachel has just described in Gautam in India and Africa, etc. In Latin America, we have relatively wealthier states. We have uh, relatively more developed uh, institutions and bureaucracies, and actually, the governments there have the capacity to bring uh, 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 interventions to scale. In Latin America, governments are the actor, actors who are leading the poverty alleviation efforts, and a huge amount of public resources are being allocated to this goal. Yet, great challenges in development remain, such as poverty and inequality. As you know, the region is highly unequal, and we still have high shares of populations living in poverty. Just to give you an example, uh, in 2013, the 21 countries in the region in Latin America spent around 700 billion US dollars for social spending, which is a lot of money, right? So we found here a really great opportunity to shape uh, government decisions by introducing uh, evidence in the process of decision making. Our goal is that we, if we shape just a little bit a share of that amount of money that is being allocated for poverty alleviation, we can really potentialize the impact of social programs that the governments in the region are implementing. So what we're doing, uh, just for you to understand, give in mind, uh, bear in mind, think about what the Nudge Unit is, do is doing in the UK, or the, uh, the, the Inset Behavior team are doing, etc. So we're trying to do something similar in the region. We're trying to work directly with the ministers of our region to embed evidence in the process of decision making. Our idea is that if we mix evidence with the pro social programs that are nevertheless being implemented in the program, we can really potentialize the impact that the government can have in poverty alleviation. So how do we do this, right? So we've been thinking a lot about how we can develop a model to embed uh, consuming and production evidence within the government. And we have come up with this learning cycle, which is the one that we try to embed with governments. Just for you to know, we're trying to have this scheme institutionalized in seven different ministries in five countries of the region. And I'm going to later talk about one example, which is in Peru, but this is the, the, the main model. So what we know, for instance, the first thing that we know is that 
we, we do is we work directly with the governments identifying specific problems and challenges that are facing in a specific sector. This can be education, this can be health, this, this can be, for instance, condition, conditional cash transfers. The second thing that we do is that once we have identified a problem or a challenge that the program, the, the government is really trying to solve, we bring a global body of evidence to inform the policies that could be implemented or tested in this new country. Obviously, we will understand what type, what lessons of that uh, evidence can be actually relevant to the government and the, the country that we're working with. Afterwards, we bring academics into the table and we, decide, and we design together the public sector and the academics new interventions that can be tested in this government. Afterwards, after we design this intervention, obviously including a randomness design trial so we can actually measure what works and what doesn't work, we, it's the government's responsibility to implement the innovation and it's our responsibility, I mean, the academic's responsibility to run the analysis and the experimental evaluation. The objective of that is at the end, we will provide results of these impact evaluations and we will provide high, high quality, rigorous evidence for the government to actually make decisions on whether to scale this, this program or to use this evidence generated and incorporating another learnings. This can mean having new testing, new interventions or uh, changing specifics of the program. So as I mentioned, we're doing this in seven different projects, but I'm gonna give you an example on how we do this in the Ministry of Education in Peru. So in the Ministry of Education in Peru, we have created a laboratory of innovation which promotes innovation and learning through low cost improvements to education policy. How does it work? So we go, we're JPAL, we're really happy, we wanna help people, and then we say, government, we want to help you, but we want to embed capacity in there, right? So what we did is that we created a team of professionals in evaluation that is embedded in the government itself. It is found in the strategic unit, unit for uh, strategic planning in the government, and that allows us to do two things. As we're based there, we're obviously working with all the different areas from the ministry that are facing challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So this allows us to identify the most pressing needs, that they're, the problems that they need to solve. And on the other hand, we bring academics to I have a problem with this, okay. We bring academics that give advice to this team that is embedded within the ministry. So why we bring academics to do two things? Well, as Rachel mentioned before, uh, JPAL is a network of academics that run RCTs to run randomized control trials to understand what works and what doesn't work in poverty elevation in different sectors. But by bringing academics into advising this team, what we do is that one, we ensure quality that all the, the, the trials that we will do within the ministry will have high quality research and will be rigorous, but also it will allow us to identify which of those innovations or which of those challenges that the government is facing represent actual, actual learning opportunities for us to provide, a, to learn something new about how we can tackle these challenges. So in this setting, just remember we're having together working the public sector and we're having the academic workings, uh, working together. So that's allowed us to respond to two pressing needs. One is that we generate a private good for the, for obviously for the minister because we're solving a problem, we're solving a question that is relevant to them and how to solve a problem. But also we are creating a public good for other institutions because we're answering questions that are relevant not just to this government in particular, but also to other governments that are facing similar challenges. Of course, as JPAL is a network of researchers, our, uh, the results of these uh, po uh, impact evaluations obviously are published and as well the data. So just for you to have an idea, currently in the Minedula, which is the laboratory of education uh, in Peru, we're testing nine innovations as for now. So I'm gonna tell you an example about one innovation that we're testing. So in Peru, there are high dropout rates in secondary school. We lose a lot of people in secondary, and then we have really low enrollment rates in higher education. So just, I, I find myself this number very impressive. Just 26% of the population had finished a higher education, which is really low, right? So the government identified this as one of the most pressing challenges, and in the context of the Minedulab, we were thinking of what, how, what we can do to solve this problem, right? So we, have, we as JPAL, have evidence elsewhere 
that actually solving information mismatches can reduce dropout. This is just providing uh, students information about <coughs> the opportunities they can have to, uh, to access higher education or the benefits of as, uh, as, uh, accessing higher levels of education can bring to them. So we brought this, this uh, evidence that we have, and I will tell you the, the evidence that we use. Okay, this is not working, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. <laughs> so in the Dominican Republic, there was one intervention in which uh, we provided information to record returns to education, and we found that it increased in 0.2 additional years of education for the following four years. And also, we tried something similar elsewhere in the region, in Chile, but providing information to students about how higher uh, grades and a greater effort, of course, can increase the likelihood of accessing uh, financial aid and scholarship for higher education. And in that study, we found that uh, it, it will decrease absenteeism in the next month by 12% and also increase uh, enrollment in college preparatory high schools by 10%. So maybe if you look at the example of Dominican Republic and you say, okay, 0.2 average years of education, uh, it's a little bit, no? But remember this was one intervention, one time, one video, one minute. It's nothing. It costs nothing. And it's a really cost-effective way to, to keep children in school, right? So of course, what we say is, okay, there are ways in which we can provide inform uh, information can increase uh, time attendance and, and remain uh, decrease dropout rates in school. And we decided to say, okay, this was a potential intervention that could be tested in, in, in Peru, and we created a new pilot that is called Deciding for a Better Future. Of course, before deploying this intervention in, in Peru, we found out that there, there was a problem on, you know, of information in the kids, and then obviously these lessons were relevant to the context, right? So currently, we're testing this, this intervention in Peru, and we're having two experiments. The one experiment that we're doing is we're deploying massive treatment, we, we call massive treatment. We bring videos, which is sort of like soap operas. I don't know if those of you are familiar with Latin America. We love telenovelas, so it's very, <laughs> children pay attention to that. So we bring soap operas to learning to the value of education, but also we're providing them information about career selection and scholarship for a dream. This is the opportunities for financial day, uh, financial aid they can access. So this is one treatment. The second treatment is that we're providing the same information, but through tablets and infographic to children and their parents at home. There we go. So this app treatment, we provide information through infographics, as I mentioned, about the same information that I said below, uh, before, but to parent the children at home. And what we can learn about this intervention are two things. One, if we can, I mean, if these information interventions are effective to increase, to decrease dropout rates and increase uh, higher degree education enrollment, but also to understand the relative cost, cost effectiveness of this intervention, right? Like, Obviously, the cost of the second one is higher versus the cost of the first one, and we will be able to provide the minister information on how they could potentially scale up this intervention. So we believe this approach has really high potential because the government is already waiting for these results, the government is implementing this intervention, and the government just want to wait, as I said, for the results to decide whether to scale up or not. So this is done just in 3,000 uh, schools around. I, I, just, I didn't mention that previously, but it's 3,000 schools. But actually, they can, this can reach the over 5 million uh, children uh, that are enrolled in public education in Peru. So we believe this is a very great opportunity. But bear in mind that we're not just testing this opportunity, we're this uh, intervention, we're testing other nine interventions. So just think about how many and how much things we can learn by bringing these interventions into this process. So so honestly, this is just a, um, a work we have started just two years ago, and we're trying to understand how we can embed the use of evidence within governments across the region. So as for now, as I mentioned previously, we have other seven projects, uh, partnerships ongoing in different countries of the region, in, in five countries, and I think our main challenge is to see actually this cycle working continuously and providing us evidence about different uh, interventions that could be actually potential scale-ups for governments and the governments actually do that. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, uh, Gotham, and Vivian. My name is John Floretta. I also work at j based in the Cambridge office in Massachusetts. And I'll play the role of moderator, largely using the questions that have been asked and submitted uh, through the Google Sheet. So Rachel, the first question I think goes to you. And the one that received the most votes of, of interest <laughs> is that Lant Pritchett has argued that we lack evidence on whether research actually improves policy. So that was a, a key part of uh, this presentation. So perhaps we can give uh, a few other examples in addition to the ones that we've shared so far about how research, the role of research in shaping policy. But the second part of the question kind of gets at the theory of change about how that happens. So for example, do we feel that policymakers lack information or are they choosing bad policy because that promotes their self-interest? And so I think one part of this question I'd like you to answer is what other factors are there in addition to evidence uh, that shapes policy? I think it's important to recognize that not all actors in the policy space um, are uh, altruistic and want to improve um, the, the lives of the poor just um, for that reason. Uh, and that evidence isn't the only thing that's going to come into their calculations. However, I think it's wrong to assume that it's not part of their calculation, that it doesn't play some role. Um, because <coughs> especially in democracies where, uh, b where there is a political cycle where if you deliver better results on the ground, there is a benefit to, to, to the governments. Um, it, it, you know, if you, if you improve your programs and people do better, you're more likely to be elected. So we're not saying that, ever, that all policymakers are only driven by evidence, but I think it's also very true from our experience, we find a lot of people really care about improving their programs, but don't know how to improve it. Um, I think what's key uh, in what we do is selecting and working with the actors in government who do care, who do want to improve their programs, or who have incentives to improve their programs. Um, there's no point in hitting your head against a brick wall with somebody who really doesn't want to improve their program. Um, but even in the cases as we see, like the Raskin, the subsidized rice in Indonesia, where there, in some ways there were some actors in the program who had a clear incentive to keep the corruption going, we still see uh, massive improvements, and some actors within government um, are, are, in, are, are really responding to that evidence. And in terms of Lance's question is, is does, uh, uh, does research improve uh, policy? I think, you know, uh, what is it, something like um, 300 million lives have been um, touched through, through the scale up of programs that uh, we have evaluated at JPAL um, and have been scaled up really. We can't say, you know, I haven't done a randomized trial and I can't say with absolute certainty that that's because of the trial. Um, but the work that we've put in, I think there are many, many examples where we can show you a pretty clear chain where uh, there wasn't evidence, people didn't know the evidence, now there is evidence um, and people, we can show you quotes from people who said, I took this action because of the evidence. So I think, um, you know, we can't provide 100% certainty in every case that it was the research that changed people's minds. But if you think about the huge volumes of money that have uh, the huge changes that we've seen that, are, that appear to be linked to this evidence, I think there's now a lot of examples that people are responding to this evidence. Great, thanks. So uh, in addition, if you want to hear, want to learn more about other programs which have been scaled up where j Evidence has played a contributing role, you can have a look at the scale up section of the j website, which features some of these examples as well as some others. Gautam, the, the next question is for you. So you, in terms of the teaching at the right level uh, scale up or the supplementary remedial education program, you said that uh, building capacity for the government to use data and make mid-course corrections is an important part of the assistance that j provides. So can you provide an example of when the government, uh, any of the state governments that you're working with, 
has made one of these course corrections um, during the scale up? And what are some challenges that we might face on the political or bureaucratic level when a mid-course correction is necessary? Okay. Um, so first, just to, to frame the answer to this question. So as I mentioned, you know, the aim was to get the basics right. The basics is they can read, they can do mass operations, just to keep, to keep that in mind in terms of what <coughs> a mid-course correction looks like. Um, so what, what does it look like? So first of all, there's this set of school supervisors, typically they're not even used to doing this because they don't have this data in the first place, so just getting them into that mindset. The type of data they can see from mid-course correction, so um, one case was we saw that the language, so the, the Gujarati learning levels um, in that state, were moving up at midway through the program when the midway check was done, the midway assessment. The maths was not, and also when we were doing these process checks, process checks, you know, walking into school, unannounced what's going on, teachers weren't doing much of the maths because maybe you know, they don't like maths, they don't think they're a maths teacher. Uh, the language activities, maybe they feel they're more friendlier, there's mind maps, there's different, different, different games. So the mid-course correction is saying those group of supervisors tell your teachers, let's have maths happening in schools as well, you know, in, in that dedicated um, time. And in terms of, you talk about what type of backlash or resistance um, there might be, because it's straightforward and simple, you know, what we're trying to do, everybody very much is on board with this idea that let's just get the children getting these basics right. You know, there hasn't been that type of resistance um, in this, but very much support. Okay. Um, Vivian, I'll let you take the, the stab at this one. This is a, a general question. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how to present evidence to policymakers. So especially when there's a large body of complex evidence. What kinds of tools or formats do you think are most effective for aggregating uh, evidence in ways that policymakers find useful? Okay. So, you know, at j we have a bunch of body of uh, evidence and we have provided these, you know, policy briefs and really explained really easily what's the lesson of, the, of, of one specific uh, research. But actually the questions I receive the most, at least when I work with the government, is okay, but this is one study in one setting, right? So we've actually developed another framework that is another great uh, lecture that Rachel has about how to generalize evidence. So one is to uh, actually teach and I mean show uh, governments how can they use uh, that information and how can they translate it into their context, taking into account, of course, other type of evidence as well as descriptive evidence, etc. For the best way to show uh, this lesson is to be really specific about the causal mechanism that was at stake, what is the causal mechanism that we're testing, and what is the actual lesson that we can learn from the intervention that we, uh, that we were uh, testing, obviously, because governments will not care much about you know, like a lot of standard deviations and et cetera. We have to be really careful about what we learn about the causal mechanism and about the underlying theory, economic theory that we are addressing and what we can learn from those. So from my experience, I can see that the best way to do is to provide a bunch, a lead review, like many different evaluations that are addressing the same causal mechanisms, et cetera, explain the difference between them and just say it in a really, you know, comprehensive, simple uh, language. Thank you. Can I, can I just yeah. add on that point, which is um, <clears throat> when, we, when we're talking about persuading governments, it's, it's not a question of going in and providing a presentation like this and walking away. That, that doesn't work. Um, it's really you've got to work with the team um, for a long time. I mean, uh, Gautam showed you the picture of you know, sitting around a small table and thrashing it out. Um, and, and you've heard examples of people sitting in ministries. So it can, this is a discussion. This is an ongoing discussion where you allow the government to say, ah, but you know, our context is different in this way, or the thing I'm worrying about is this, or how are we going to solve the practical problem of getting the, getting the teachers to change what they're doing? Um, and, and this can take months and you know, years even, uh, certainly up to a year thrashing out how you're going to take that evidence and make it work for this particular government and let them throw at you all the challenges. Um, in a sense, if it's too easy, it's not going to work. You've got to, you, you know you're getting through when they, get, when they start coming up with the objections of saying, well, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And you work together to, uh, to figure out those challenges, knowing or in the back of your head 
all the evidence that, all the evidence base. So, it's, so when Vivian talks about the, the literature review, it's not that we give them a copy of a literature review. She has that literature review in the back of her head so that when someone says, well, what about doing it that way? She can say, yes, that worked very well doing it that way in this other country. Or, you know what? That's actually fundamentally takes us away from the theory of change and it was tried in this other country and it didn't work. So it's really coming up with this, using your knowledge of the evidence to provide very practical uh, help and support to the governments. Can I just add a bit more on that as well? Could you just, um, no one says on this, just adding straight from where Rachel was saying is, one, we're talking about governments owning these scale-ups. It's, it's not our scale-up, it's not our teachers or you know, whoever the people are. And one way to do that is very much having the conversation led by them, forgetting our data, what's their own data, what are their own targets, and framing the conversation along, along that. They, they have their priorities. And the other part of it, we, we don't present in here's our clean technical package, you know, here, here's our solution, it's not that. We spend a lot of time in their schools. Like If we're in Andhra Pradesh, they don't care about the Uttar Pradesh schools so much because they know there's contextual differences. We spend time in their schools, we, you know, we see what's happening, we convey that. Other things we do, we also have a very short video, for example, of their own teachers giving feedback on how well this program's going. When we show that video, that's far more powerful than our own charts, and that's part of it as well, as Rachel was saying, you know, the, the, the evidence, yeah, um, the RCTs, that's part of it, but very much making sure they own the conversation from their own context as well. So there are multiple ways that we're doing that. So evidence kind of opens the door and then there's the opportunity to have a much broader discussion. And from their perspective, like you're literally trying to say, you know, how do they see this problem from their own eyes and starting the conversation there, opposed to starting from, here's what we've got to bring to the table. Gautam, there's quite a bit of interest about this supplementary education program you referred to. Mm -hmm. um, and people say that the gains in literacy that happened in Uttar Pradesh are amazing. However, did you come across any issues where older students who are grouped into a less literate group felt a degree of shame? So like, does this, okay. is, there, is there some negative social consequences of grouping right. a fifth grade student with a third grade right. student? So this is often a question we hear from the lower down people in administration. They're like, they won't like it. Like a class five child will not want to be in learning level group number two, for example. And they say, you know, how will they emotionally? But one thing to bear in mind is in this program, as I mentioned, it's, it's only um, two hours a day. In the sense, what you're saying is intensively, and for that particular program, Uttar Pradesh is only for 50 days. It's a short term accelerated learning program, get them to grade level. So I think one part of is to bear that in mind, that you're saying that just for a section of time, we're intensively putting you in this group, and then you return to your normal grade class for the rest of the time. And the other part of it is that, you know, the, you know, the fair question to that child is, do you wanna move on through those years not being a reader, or do you want the chance to be grouped having targeted instruction so that you can reach grade level you know, by the time you get to cl class five? So I think there's, there's two ways to um, talk about that. Uh, Rachel, I wanted to ask you a, a, a general question that Vivian referred to of this framework for when we decide evidence in one context can be applied, evidence generated in one context can be applied in another. Can you say a little bit about how you think about that framework and then work that you're helping to advise in Africa to apply that framework, which is, I think, a nice parallel to what's happening in South Asia? So I'll try and talk about this very briefly. I have an hour-long talk which helps people um, uh, through this framework. But I think there's been a lot of confusion about, in the discussion about whether evidence from one context can translate into evidence in another context. Right? Uh, we've got to think about different kinds of evidence and different kinds of problems. Uh, so. I'm actually going to take a, a, a different example of, um, of incentives for immunization, which is a program that I worked on in, uh, in India and had a massive increase, led to a massive increase in um, full immunization in India when we gave small incentives for parents to come and, and immunize their child. Now, you might think, uh, I'm also working with governments in West Africa, in particular in Sierra Leone, who are worrying about low levels of immunization. And if I think about will that evidence translate to working with a government in West Africa, you know, one was working with an NGO in India, the other is a government in, 
in West Africa, different continent, different implementer. So you think, well, how on earth would that evidence generalize? But let's be a little bit clearer about what we think the question is. One, one part of it is, do humans respond to small nudges, small incentives? Can they be persuaded to invest in long-term health needs, preventative health care with small nudges? And that is something that has been found to generalize a lot. And that is a question about fundamental human behavior. If you take another bit of the question, it's, you know, if you just look at the program as a package and say, you know, in India we had an NGO providing lentils for incentives to get immunized. Well, do I think the lentils generalize to West Africa? No, they don't eat lentils. It's not a good incentive, right? So when we say, does research generalize, we have to be a bit careful about what we are, which question we're asking. Lentils don't generalize. Underlying general human behavior, we actually turn out to be very similar across different contexts. The third part of the question is, can the implementer deliver the incentive and not have leakage? And again, that's going to be very context specific. So when you're thinking about whether research generalizes, you need to ask yourself, is the need the same in the old context and the new context? And in this case, it was. There was initial high levels of immunization. People got the first shot, but they didn't get, they didn't persist to the end. So is the need the same? The second question is, um, is, the, uh, is the general pattern of behavior, do we have a lot of evidence of the general pattern of underlying behavior? In this case, small nudges can have big impacts on preventative health take up. That does generalize. And then we've got questions of logistics, of what's the most effective way to uh, implement this. And that's going to be different in different contexts. So that's you know, a two-minute summary of a complicated framework, but I think it's very important as you think about taking evidence to different contexts to think through those different components uh, and what evidence you have. And you will use RCT evidence potentially for human behavior. You may need descriptive evidence for what is the need um, and process monitoring for the logistics <coughs> questions. So different kinds of evidence to answer different kinds of questions. Okay. Um, I want to thank the panelists, uh, Rachel, Gotham, Vivian, for sharing your experiences. And I really want to thank the Center for Effective Altruism for giving uh, Jay Powell the opportunity to, to run this panel. We'll be uh, next door in the West Ballroom for a few minutes afterwards in case people want to ask uh, follow-up questions and a couple of questions we didn't get a chance to get to. So thank you very much. <laughs>